Whakarongo ake au ki te tangi a te manu e re re runga rawa e. Tui, 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 tui a, tui a ki runga, tui a ki raro, tui a ki roto, tui a ki waho, tui, tui, tui a ti hei mauri ora. Ka mihi aroha ki a koutou e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā haue whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora mai. How are you? It's after lunch. Welcome. We're going to keep you totally invigorated for the next 45 minutes. Thank you for coming along. An honour and a privilege, I have to say, given the audience and the presentations we've heard so far. My name, Jan Hania, Next Foundation Environmental Director. Can I introduce Devin McLean, Environmental Advisor for Next. He's also the Project Leader, Project Director for uh, Project Yarn Zoom, one of Next projects, a member of the New Zealand Conservation uh, Authority uh, for all of New Zealand. He sits as a governance member on the Biodiversity uh, Heritage Science Challenge. Generally, I've uh, been working in this space for a long time, has a lot of knowledge and uh, professional discipline to bring to our work. Devon. We also have, sorry, Devin, we also have uh, Al Bramley, CEO of ZIP. He has uh, been leading the ZIP program now for uh, around a year and a bit. Uh, comes from a civil engineering background, and also a leader of an eco education program based out of the Hawke's Bay. Kia mai tato. Kia ora, Devin. Good afternoon, friends. It's amazing, and what a day and a little bit, you suddenly feel like you're a friend in this place. Um, congratulations to the organisers. This is, this is an awesome place to, uh, to share and we're very excited to put some of our thinking up, on, up for you to have, take a look at, tear apart, give us some new bright ideas. The title is Ecological Resilience, uh, the Challenge and the Opportunity. So what do we want to do? We want to talk a bit about the, uh, the opportunities that are out there in terms of this challenge. Outline the challenge, talk about why it is an opportunity for New Zealand, and uh, give you an update on some progress that's being made there. Before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Next Foundation. How many of you know of the Next Foundation? Quite a few, I think, yeah. So this was a, a foundation uh, endowed by Neil and Annette Plowman, a couple from the far north. They live in Kerry, Kerry most of the time and they're passionate about New Zealand's environment and education, and they're passionate about them because they see them as two of the game changers for New Zealand. And so they created this wonderful foundation, uh, and uh, we set it up in March uh, 2014. We've got $100 million in the bank account, and we've been told to spend it over 10 years. So this is not a fund that's going to work off the interest, this is a fund that's uh, spending the capital. Uh, to make a difference. And uh, we're interested in projects that are transformational and that are sustainable. So large-scale projects that could transform uh, the New, Le New Zealand landscape and uh, that, that uh, are sustainable for the future. Okay, so we're looking at a legacy for New Zealand in environment and education uh, for future generations. So I wanted to start back at the beginning in terms of our environmental programs, and I'm not going to talk about the education programs at all today, just the environmental ones. But going back to the, to the beginning, why is this uh, a challenge and an opportunity for us? So 80 million years ago, thereabouts, New Zealand separated from other land masses. And for 80 million years, we've had a unique process of evolution here in the development of our species. We've got some curious characters. Uh, some of you will have met these guys, so the Kiwi, um, the Tuatara, our living dinosaur, um, and this guy, the carnivorous land snail, the Palafanta. Uh, some of the examples of species that have been around for a very, very long time um, in New Zealand. So we, we are blessed with uh, a, a great variety of uh, species that are unique to New Zealand. We were pretty late coming to the human party. That's been talked about in the last uh, day or so. So. Uh, Somewhere around the 13th century, we had the Polynesian uh, settlement or start in, in New Zealand. Much more recently, uh, Abel Tasman, 1642, uh, the start of the European um, colonisation in New Zealand. So those other species have been here for a very long time, and we've been here for kind of a nanosecond, really. And it's extraordinary the amount of damage that we've managed to do in that time. You've also learnt that we only have uh, bats as terrestrial mammals. So the really unique thing about New Zealand is we are a country of birds. Um, the mammals all came later. The, the mammals came for various reasons. One of them was that European settlers arriving in New Zealand thought it was a bit of a strange place because there was 
not much to hunt, and uh, there wasn't very much that was familiar at all. And so they set about uh, trying to turn it into some form of what they were used to in Europe. There was also a bunch of accidental introductions to New Zealand, the rats that came down the ropes of the ships and so on. So big changes in a very short period of time. So we got all these guys and others. You've got goats there and rats and stoats and possums and over on the far side, the wasp, which is a much more recent uh, introduction. Exotic pests in New Zealand eliminate something estimated at 24 million um, birds per annum. Oops, this is interesting. We've got 800 species uh, at least, and we don't know all our species by any means, but of the species we know, which might only be 25%, 800 of them at severe risk of extinction. There are many iconic species, um, flora and fauna, uh, that are seriously endangered. And the current investment is not holding the line. It's, uh, it's not dealing to the problem. Uh, there are potential new risks coming from climate change. We talked a bit about that yesterday, and we'll talk a little more about what those might be. So we've got, um, we've got this opportunity with uh, an amazing uh, landscape and biodiversity. And uh, in many ways, this uh, landscape and this biodiversity is our version of other things that people use as huge tourist attractions in other parts of the world. So the pyramids um, or the Roman um, ruins and so on, um, these things are, are uh, used as, a, as tourist opportunities from, for, from different countries around the world. And our big difference in, in many ways is this unique biodiversity. It's also, we also have um, an integrated and integral indigenous culture here, which is uh, a, a long relationship with the species that we have. Our biodiversity is deeply embedded in the national psyche, and um, it's increasingly known and, uh, and valued by people all over the world. And so we see our tourist figures go from 2 million a year 13 years ago to 3 million this year and a forecast that it could go to 4 million in, in four years' time. Amazing acceleration. And most of those people are saying they're coming here to see New Zealand's nature or to enjoy New Zealand nature. So in that sense, it's a key economic and, and social advantage to the country. Somebody said New Zealand's biodiversity is the closest thing on Earth to visiting another planet. Kind of an interesting comment. So how is NEXT thinking about the challenges associated with this? Well, we started with pretty small beginnings. Uh, Rotoroa Island and the Hauraki Gulf. Anybody been there? One or two? Yeah, off the end of Waiheke. Small project uh, to transform an island and to return it as a, as a new park to the, the people of New Zealand. We moved uh, upper scale in, in 2012 to the, to the Abel Tasman National Park. So from 83 hectares to... 22,000 hectares, with a project extending over 30 years uh, with three key phases, um, securing the park against the negative influences in the park, which were the pests and the weeds and some other challenges, um, restoring the biodiversity to the park, um, many species that have been lost, others in very small numbers in the park, and thirdly, a future-proofing piece. So how do we engage the community? How do we get the kids involved? How do we create the future custodians of that project? We're four years into that. We're making good progress. And as we had hoped, it's proven to be a model for what we might uh, consider supporting next. Um, in the case of the Abel Tasman, uh, we put in place a, an arrangement with the government, which we call the Tomorrow Accord. So one of the issues for us is that we don't want to create endowment funds that are going to generate the funds to look after this place forever, but obviously it's going to have to be looked after uh, forever. What we think we can do is invest in the transformation. So we can set some targets out there uh, for the indicators of ecological transformation for the park, and we can go after those, and when we realise those, we want to hand the responsibility over to somebody. And the somebody in this case, the logical person to hand it over to is the government. They've got the deep pockets, they're responsible for our national parks. So we have an accord with the Crown that says if we can achieve these ecological outcomes, or when we do, and that might take us 15 or 20 or 25 years, but when we do, uh, we'll have this arrangement. Part of that deal was that we would then start looking at the next projects that we would take on. And that's the one that I'd like to yarn to address now. From those humble beginnings of Rotorua Island and Hauraki Gulf, Abel Tasman, 29,000 hectares. We're now moving on to the largest uh, project that NEXT has actually invested in. 
And it's, uh, it's not large, it's not just large in expenditure, it's also large in complexity. It's the first time we've involved a true community collaborative partnership. And we're just beginning that journey now. It's been two years of incubation to get to just starting, and we're yet to form the, uh, you know, the proper governance and management structures, structures to make that work well. So just for some context, the park itself and the conservation land around it is about 30,000 hectares, 38,000 hectares, and the primary aim is to eradicate predators from that mountain and, and suppress uh, to very low levels, and then translocate, relocate uh, the native natural flora and fauna back onto it. And so here we have uh, Mount Taranaki uh, National Park, uh, the Poakai mountain range and the Kaitaki mountain range, and also we've included Ngaumutu, the islands in front of New Plymouth, which are also going to be restored as part of this project. In partnership with us, we'll be working with the regional council in that region and the community who are already involved in wide-scale uh, possum suppression throughout the whole region. So with our 38,000 hectares of restoration that we'll do on the mountain, we can uh, augment a very powerful halo using the regional council community and the community itself. So this is the first real leverage model for NEXT, where our funding is making up around 20 to 30% of the total expenditure. It's where DOC has reorientated some of its funding to also leverage with us so that we can bring in other partners as well. Uh, DOC is a primary partner in this, uh, as are iwi. There are eight iwi uh, uh, in the Taranaki area, and they, for the first time, have come around and, uh, and met to agree on how to work together on this project. It's quite a big step in the journey for New Zealand, I think. It's the second Tomorrow Accord qualifying project, which Devin mentioned earlier. And as I was saying, as we build and restore on the mountain, the potential for the halo to grow is quite significant. There will be opportunity for community trusts and other corporate sponsors to play a significant role in this. So you can imagine the complexity that comes with developing a project of this scale. So over time, we'll build to 80,000 hectares around the mountain and beyond potentially the whole landscape around Mount Taranaki. We believe... Only at scale can we secure the kind of ecological resilience that's necessary for sustainability. Kia ora. So, ecological resilience, why, why does this uh, matter so much to us? Well, we know New Zealand biodiversity continues to decline. Um, we know that climate change is going to act, uh, impact in a number of ways. A couple of obvious ones are the direct impact through changes in storm patterns, changes in temperature, changes in rainfall. Um, but another one that I think we really have to focus on is the distraction of government uh, once these things really start to hit. The investment that's required in infrastructure and change uh, to deal with uh, changing patterns there. So there's a kind of a window of opportunity, if you like, uh, to address some of this. Those climate change effects are already visible um, and they're going to be much more visible in the next two to three decades. So we've been starting to think about um, a portfolio of properties which if we could put them into uh, the right kind of state would make a big difference for biodiversity in New Zealand. So we think the answer is in securing a suite of representative uh, properties across the New Zealand conservation estate and uh, ensuring that the populations of species on those are in good shape ensuring the effectiveness of biosecurity around those sites, engaging the New Zealand public in the challenge, and taking action now. We don't have a lot of time to wait in this process. So we've identified a suite of properties with the assistance of the Department of Conservation. Um, this is not the final list, and we're not saying that NEXT is going to tackle all of these projects either. But if we were to put this suite of properties into uh, a state where, they no longer, where, the, where the biodiversity on those sites is no longer battling pests and weeds and other challenges, they have a better chance to deal with what's coming in terms of, of climate change. So some of you will know these properties well, and I'm just going to flick them up there and I'm not going to talk to each of them. 
Um, but two, two pieces of reasoning behind this. Firstly, they're all, uh, they're all substantial in terms of the biodiversity that exists. Uh, secondly, they're quite different in terms of the actual biodiversity on those sites. Uh, thirdly, some of them, like Mount Taranaki, provide that sea level to 2,500 metre altitude range, which allows species to flex their position. Thirdly, there's also a latitudinal range there, and while there are not corridors joining all of these uh, places, there is an opportunity to shift species at some point in time if that became essential to uh, preserving the biodiversity. But there's more. And uh, one of the really exciting things that we're working on is this concept of, of predator-free New Zealand. So we can put these, the sweeter properties into a, a better state over time by working uh, collectively together. But actually, at the end of the day, we would really like to deal with predators in New Zealand. And in this case, I'm talking about uh, the three big ones, the rats, the stoats, and the possums. And there are kind of three critical challenges in here. One is a technical one. Can we actually do this stuff? The second one is a financial one. Who, who would pay for it if we were actually going to do this? And one of the biggies, and perhaps uh, the one that we've made least progress on at this date, and perhaps the one that we might get some feedback from this group on, is the social one. So do New Zealanders really want this, and are they prepared to make the trade-offs that might be involved in the various methodologies that need to be deployed? So I'm going to ask Al just to talk a little bit about um, ZIP and what ZIP contribution could be to predator-free New Zealand. So kia ora everybody, my name's Al Bramley and um, yeah, it's good to be here. I, I came last year so I, I said last night I'm a serial offender, I've come back for more and the cool thing about coming here is that I get in my technical world all these different perspectives on the problems I face. So keen to tell you a little bit about some of the technical detail. So I'm going to dive into some detail to try and give you a window on my world. So firstly what does it do? I'll let you read that but the key things here are we're going for zero. We often talk about predator free, but we mean predator low. Now the difference here is if we go to zero, then we don't have to constantly manage for the rebounding populations, okay? So I'm trying to shift to an economic model, which means that once we've cleared it out, and it might cost a lot up front, but once we've cleared it out, we keep it down. I'll tell you a bit more why. But first, a little bit about me. I've picture of my daughter Maddie, because she's so cute. We talk about reconnecting kids with nature. I totally attest to that. My kids love nature, and they totally value the environment, because I stuck them in it from when they are about this high. So, totally on that train. So, the reason I've got my um, daughter Maddie up there, because she's holding a Kiwi. I was involved in a Kiwi recovery project with Rude and others a long time ago. But most people don't realise that if we don't eliminate stoats, or if we allow stoats to run through our landscape, 95% of kiwi chicks get killed, which means slowly kiwi go to extinction everywhere we don't look after them, which is most places. Okay? So they're very sensitive to stoats. The other thing is, unlike most places in the world, if you stop cutting down your habitat, and you stop hunting the things you care about, your biodiversity recovers. And I don't know if you guys realise this yet, but it does not like that here in New Zealand. We've pretty much stopped cutting down our habitat. We've got this wonderful one third of the country that's set aside as Department of Conservation Estate. But the trouble is, a whole lot of our species are still going to zero out of the things we care about. So we have to do something. At the moment, we have to kill stuff in order to maintain our native species. Right, so as Devin mentioned, there's three predators that we're focused on. Rats, stoats and possums. Simply because they cause 80% of the ecological damage. Yes, cats are in that equation as well, but to be honest, socially complex, we'd rather stay away from it for now. So <laughs> if, we, if, we crack it, if we crack it for these three, then we'll go and have a look at cats, maybe. But we might let Gareth Morgan lead that one. He's done quite a good job stirring up the world. Mm. Okay, so why do we think we can do this? Quite simply, we used, we used to think we couldn't do this at all. We started on some offshore islands. We started with a one hectare island. And we didn't even think we could do one hectare. And surprise, surprise, we cleared the rats off it. That was back in the 60s. And then we got on to bigger projects like Kapiti. And in the 80s and 90s, we managed to remove rats 
and possums off it. Now, I think here the really interesting transformational lesson is that in the 70s, the Forest Service that was looking after these places, the current thinking of the time was removal was impossible, wasting money if you try that. Now, we know it's a really cool technique. And within 20 years, that ecology has rebounded to something amazing. If you get a chance to go to any of our predator-free islands, go. They're not like the mainland. They're full of life. So we've started in the Marlborough Sounds. We started with 30 hectares in the Sounds. We're a little bit braver than maybe our predecessors. And about two years ago, we had a crack. And so to our surprise, it didn't look like it was going to be impossible. We were a bit confounded by size, and it didn't work perfectly. But with the help of the next foundation, we decided to scale up to this site, which is about 400 hectares now. And we established a zone in purple there across the peninsula where we tried to stop every rat and every possum from getting back onto that place once we'd cleared them off. And at the moment, we leak about 1% of those animals that try and get in, so it's not perfect, but no barrier is. Even if we got it to 100%, somebody would drive along in a boat and accidentally let a rat off. Or one would swim from somewhere. So we need the ability to detect and remove before things become a problem, but the technology is coming. So how are we getting on? Well, I just want to show you removal, what this looks like. Every little skull and crossbones there is a rat. And every little dot was a place that they were chewing a little peanut butter card, because they, they love peanut butter, they can't resist it. And over time, there's about a year's worth of time there, we got them to zero. We didn't use a neural toxin operation, largely because the consenting process was long and we wanted to get on with it. And it was costly. It took, cost us something like $550 a hectare to remove every last animal with people walking around, laying traps, and using toxins in bait stations. But we got there. It took us 12 months. And since then, we installed all these devices. So there's a good nature trap on there, the gas-fired one that kills repeatedly when an animal sticks its head up in the hole. There's a, it's just a good old slam-it trap in there, which are perfect for catching rats. And also there's some other devices on there, and there's a leg hole trap for possums, and to be honest, that's pretty controversial, but I put it up there deliberately because it's our most effective trap by a factor of five. We'd love if it wasn't, but the tech hasn't got to the point of having a better trap, so we're currently still using that trap. And on the end's a bait station, and, you know, there's all sorts of mix about to toxins. We try and use the minimum of toxins. We use it last, but we'd love not to use it. In fact, so far, we've now got to the point we don't need toxins for possums, which is a really cool milestone for us. And we introduced some smart stuff. And this is where I think just a little window on where we're going to go in the future. So on the left there, there's a little platform screwed to a tree. And that's so that our ground nesting birds, Weka, can't interfere with this little device. It's a detection device. So I talked about the rats can't resist peanut butter. Well, if you take a piece of real estate sign, jam peanut butter into the core, and then mount it on a little stand, the rats climb the trees and chew away at those little cards. So if you turn up the next day, you see tooth marks, and you go, I know there's a rat here. But that's all laborious, you know? It's a lot of walking. So what we decided to do was attach some electronics to it that meant that when it was wiggled, we'd get told automatically. And so we've done this now. All of these little devices talk to each other via UHF radio. Then they get to a satellite box, goes up to space, and within an hour, I know if that site's been chewed. And that's a whole different ball game for response, because I know he's still there. Whereas if I turn up tomorrow, I don't know whether it was last week or whenever it was that I was last here, and where it is now, it will have moved on. So the speed of information is critical here to managing this quickly. And on the, on the right is just another picture of another type of device. Rats run, love running through tunnels, so we've stuck, taken that same device and we've stuck it in a tunnel. Because often it's a system of tools, not one tool, that we need in order to solve this problem. Another thing that's been key to us achieving what we've achieved is the collaborations we've got going on. So Lincoln University, have built a massive predator pen. 
We spent a quarter of a million dollars building a massive pen that we test everything before it goes to the field. Saves us a lot of time. So we're currently working on deterrent type tools, something that's completely mix, missing from our toolbox. And lastly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some detail around stoats. Stoats are the animal we haven't tried to date because they run so far and so fast. So the first thing we did was fit a little transmitter around their collar and then we let them go. And of course they're causing lots of destructive damage, but at the moment we don't know enough about them in order to manage them. So we let one go out on the end of the peninsula there, and that was called uh, Palin. You will see there's a theme coming on here. <laughs> and Palin was a, Palin represented by the yellow cross there, ran all around the end of the peninsula, sort of bouncing about a K backwards and forwards. And then T, you can probably guess what that stands for, T for Trump. A little bit of a worry, Trump and Palin spent quite a bit of time together early on, which I don't think was good for world politics. And the last one, Romney, he's the red guy there. And Oh, sorry, not the red guy, the, the red sort of hat-looking thing. He took off straight through our barrier. We set this barrier to try and stop him, and he just ran straight through it. He completely ignored us. So anyway, he's left the party, Romney, now, which is appropriate as well. So anyway... <laughs> You can see what we're doing is gathering the base behavioural information so that we know how to manage these guys and doing some pretty cool stuff along the way, having a lot of fun. And just to give you an idea where Romney went, uh, I don't know if I can point with this thing, but he was right up the top of the map there last time we tracked him. In fact, we tracked him again this morning. I got a text from the guys to say they'd found him even further away, about another three k's to the east. And the only way we can do that is using aircraft, and we use a light plane that scans the countryside, automatically talking to a computer, building a little signal map that means he's there. But the tech is coming to our world, and it's really exciting. How am I going? Completely blowing my time, aren't I? Yeah. So lastly, the future. What does it look like? A whole lot of tech's coming. UAVs are going to be a cool tool for us. They're going to get us remote places. But there's image recognition. We're hoping to use that in the future. There's a whole lot of auto-dispensing technology we want to bring to bear. And there's a whole lot of ideas we haven't even thought of yet, which is why we were so keen to connect with your guys' world. So, thanks. Okay, so we were not going to spend a lot of time on these last couple of slides, but just for completeness, one of the interesting things about this, we don't know exactly how much New Zealand spends each year on predators, but if you combine what central government uh, spends, what local government spends, what private people spend, and the cost of the damage that rats do in our agricultural sector and so on, we think it's, um, it's, it's uh, somewhere in the order of $1.5 billion a year, which sounds like a pretty good war chest. Nature underpins our $13 billion and growing tourism industry. And uh, we need to find ways to uh, get more investment um, out of the tourist sector and out of the agricultural sector uh, to go after the challenges that we've got here. Predators threaten our agricultural economy, not just directly in terms of the loss of food and so on, but also the reputation. And so there's real uh, gains to be achieved by um, getting rid of those guys. And it, that threatens our New Zealand brand. So $1.5 billion per annum. And biodiversity is still declining. So we actually need to do something completely different here. We need a new strategic investment model uh, around this space. Just talking briefly about the social license. So we've heard a lot about reconnecting with nature. And uh, one of the keys to this is going to be to continue that so that as we come to communities and we say, we need your help to make your part of New Zealand free of these species, and it's going to compromise certain things. There'll be some biosecurity issues. There'll be some use of uh, toxins in some places. Um, we'll need to put a trap in your backyard or whatever. We need that licence to do that on, a, on scale. This is a positive uniting vision for something. It's something we can take action on. We've, we've talked about it for a long time. It's been kind of out there in the ether as something we'd really like to do. The technology is getting us to the point of saying, actually, we might just be able to do this. And the, the um, examples that we're putting together in Abel Tasman, Taranaki, Cape to City, various other projects are starting to give people confidence. We can actually go after this thing. The idea that we can transition to a low maintenance cost, so not a billion and a half a year, but a, a small proportion of that long term to maintain the biosecurity. 
And also one of the critical things is we may need to use a, 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 an aerial toxin on part of the estate, but it's a different conversation with the community if you can say to them, we're only going to use it once and then we can defend the space against reinvasion. If you could go at the moment and talk to people about, um, we're going to do it now and we're going to be back in three years' time to do it again, it's not a very, uh, not a very encouraging conversation to have with the community. Another big opportunity, I think, is that we can provide a model here. So it's again this idea that is very much behind your frontiers of how do we do things here and develop technologies here that have wider application to problems around the world. And some of the smart tech stuff that we're working on certainly will. It's all about leaving an outstanding legacy for our grandchildren. We, al we also thought we should um, ask for your help directly. So this question of reconnecting with nature, how do we go about that? You guys got some ideas about that. How do we fund a predator-free campaign? What are the smart ways to actually do that? And uh, Al's big challenge, how do we detect predators in low numbers? We can knock them down to low numbers, then how do we know that one's just arrived and how do we deal with that? And we need some smart ideas in that space. So maybe I'll just leave that one up for the conversation. Thank you.